Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets, record highs hit Wall Street again, and gold and Bitcoin have had major rallies. Ross suggests natural gas may have hit a buy point. He also has a special offer for our listeners. Publisher of the Leibovit VR newsletters, Mark Leibovit, also has a special offer for you. Mark digs into gold, Bitcoin, and the possible effects of a leap year and leap day on the markets. WolfStreet.com's Wolf Richter tells us why the Fed may not lower interest rates this year and may even be thinking of raising them. He believes several U.S. banks are on the verge of collapse, but that won't have a big impact on the economy. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have an important company showcase update from Recyclico Marketing Director Tony Mitchell. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMY ZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on X at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show. Glad to be back, Jim. How did the stock markets end the week? Oh, well, more and more of the same. A pause and then new highs, and it didn't matter really which indices you're looking at. The major ones, the, the S&P and the NASDAQ, uh, really barreling along nicely here. Now, we've got a long-term objective on the S&P. The channel that it's been running in uh, projects up to 5,400 to uh, 5,600. So we're getting within spitting distance of that. And the, this is a channel that dates all the way back to the 1920s. So um, going to be interesting to see what happens when we get up there. For now, um, we've been going through these... Uh, what I call uh, sort of upside exhaustions, or uh, and um, then we're getting two to three day pullbacks in the strong stocks like Nvidia, uh, which is just enough to produce oversold readings on our springboards, and then you up and away you go again. Um, it's just uh, an endless move for now. The key will be that uh, when any one of these corrections then overlaps the previous high, which we haven't been seeing, we've been just start stepping up, but once we start to overstep the highs, then we'll be thinking about um, the uh, the overdue correction. And, we you know, we haven't had one since the, the end of October when this move really got underway. What's going on with gold? Uh, new all-time highs, and it uh, not only in U.S. dollars, uh, 1080 or at uh, 2,083 on the spot price, and in Canadian dollars, the same thing, a new record high over there. Um, silver has been underperforming. Really need to see it get through 26 to be a catalyst here on the upside. Um, the miners, uh, the GDXJ or the SLV, if you take a look at the silver stocks, have been underperforming. They've got a double bottom against the lows that we put in uh, in October, November, and uh, really just no signs of life really to speak of in there as of yet. Uh, the catalyst, I think, is going to be that $26 level in the silver market. If it, if it can manage to break out to, through there, then we could be looking at it, you know, a decent move. But for now, it's all gold and, uh, and the stock market, and that's where the activity is. What's going on with crude? Um, we've been looking for the breakout off the seasonal uh, bottom, and guess what? We hit $80 uh, on Friday, uh, so this move is nicely underway. The seasonal is in place. Uh, and uh, we're also seeing the net gas um, put out a buy recommendation on that. 
and uh, we're seeing some good action in there. Um, it's just slowly coming off the low, but uh, the big names, Shinye, uh, Chesapeake, Canadian Natural Resources, Tourmaline in the, in the gassy area have been producing uh, nice moves on the upside, and uh, we should be looking for a decent run here. Uh, we're, uh, we've had a long pause, and uh, I think we've built enough of a base to, uh, to see something good on the upside. You know, and if we take a look at uh, things like the, uh, uh, the dry bulk shipping uh, index, uh, there uh, it uh, sold off really hard into a year ago, uh, produced a selling climax and then put in a nice accumulation pattern for this last year and uh, a breakout with good signs of strength in the last week and a half. So um, you're seeing um, pretty much uh, good moves across the board in most areas. And that uh, dry bulk uh, index, the, uh, uh, the ETF, would be one that uh, people should take a look at. Uh, buy the corrections, don't chase it on the upside, uh, but uh, buy the corrections. Just like, um, you know, the uraniums, which uh, had made uh, just an excellent move into the high into January. We got a really nice pullback here, produced uh, some good oversold readings in sequential nines uh, on the daily charts uh, during the last 10 days, enough to uh, give us buy signals there. Um, these are hard oversolds within a dominant uptrends. And uh, they've got potential to, once again, go back to the old highs, if not better than that. So URA, the URNM, uh, URNJ are uh, the ETFs that uh, one uh, might take a look at uh, participating in that area. What's happening with the U.S. and Canadian dollars? Well, uh, U.S. dollar today uh, down a bit, down uh, what, uh, 30 points or so, nothing to speak of, but it was enough to give a real spurt to the gold market. Um, and uh, it's, but U.S. and Canadian dollars, basically tight trading ranges, no, no real opportunities jumping out as far as those two are concerned right now. Um, the fact that... Uh, um, the um, you know, the tips, the uh, inflation um, related uh, index, as far as the bond market is concerned, has uh, turned up nicely with the bond market. Is supportive of gold, and uh, if anything, would be negative to the U.S. dollar, but not enough to really ascertain uh, a, uh, a large position uh, against the dollar right now. Ross, you have a bargain for some people if they're looking for some advice. Yeah, we're doing the uh, we're continuing with this twenty five percent off to new subscribers uh, for annual subscriptions, and uh, we're looking for once again more opportunities. Um, you know, we've recently picked up here on uh, uh, things like the uh, uh, the crude oil, the uraniums. Uh, now, um, cotton has had a nice breakout. Uh, the number of opportunities jumping out, and the gold market uh, is probably the the big one this week. Uh, so, uh, if people want to um, uh, take a look at our service, we invite you to come along. Uh, chartsandmarkets.com is the website, and uh, there are links on the homepage there. Ross, thank you so much for being on this week in money. Thanks, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Find him on X at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Mark Leibovitt next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Mark Leibovitt, editor and publisher of the Leibovitt VR Newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. He's speaking to us from Arizona. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Your VR Forecaster annual forecast model is now available. Can you tell us about it? 
Yes, and every year in uh, February we release it. It's basically a cyclical projection of the of various markets that we track, uh, whether it's uh, crude oil, the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, Bitcoin, gold, and lithium, natural gas. We can go on in the whole list. So it gives us like a little time projection based on cycle studies that we do and been doing it since 1987. It's incredible how long this has been going on. And it was just sort of an accident. We just put it together. Somebody asked me, well, what do you think the market's going to do for the year? And I'm a technician, trader, you know, mostly volume studies and so forth. We do, you know, a lot of geocosmic and the cyclical stuff too. But this is sort of a new area for me at the time. So, you know, we threw something together in 1987. Uh, the model called for the, the crash. It actually was like a little sketch and it showed this big vertical down line in October. And at the beginning of the year, I, I published it and I said, well, it looks like you got to watch for a nasty step in October of this year. And that was early in 87. So, you know, you get spoiled a little bit and every year we've been putting it out and expanded it to other markets. And it's not a hundred percent, but it's worked really well. If you go to our webpage at vrtrader.com and pull up the VR forecaster, you'll see results of the previous year forecast just for the Dow Industrials. In the last couple of years, it's been really good. Uh, did a great call on Bitcoin this past year, um, you know, calling for the uh, up move. So, you know, there's just, uh, it's, it's a product and there's something you want to have on your desk and you can look at it through the course of the year and see the little zigs and zags at the various markets might take. So it's called the VR Forecaster. Uh, it's on sale here at, uh, How Street Radio, 50% off. Uh, use the promo code 2022 half off. Just go to vrtrader.com, click on VR Forecaster and enter that 2022 half off promo code and, uh, you get a, you get a deal. So it's worth looking at. It's been really good. Do you have a special offer for This Week in Money listeners? Uh, they could take the same uh, offer on the uh, code uh, 2022 half off on any of our products. And while we're talking about the newsletter, I did want to disclose that I'm not a financial advisor, nor do I provide financial advice, but we sure talk a lot about the markets, don't we? <laughs> 2024 is a leap year. Thursday, a leap day. Does leap year, leap day tend to have any effect on the markets? Well, history shows, believe it or not, that stocks tend to perform worse when there's an additional day added to the calendar. Now, this is just an historical study. I didn't do it myself. They said the S&P 500 total return index has an average of a 10.8% gain during leap years and a 12.8% jump during non-leap years. So uh, according to the fact that um, we had one this year, it says uh, the data data set that I'm looking at goes back to 1971. So it actually says we're going to do worse this year because of the leap day that was added. Interesting. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ hit new all-time highs on Friday. What do you see ahead for those indices? Well, I'll be honest to our listeners, it surprised me that we're this strong right now because we're in a cyclical period where basically from mid-February to the end of March, markets tend to pull back and correct a bit. And uh, even though it is a presidential election year and there's all those reasons to believe that you know markets are being... Uh, supported by government actions and so forth uh, you can go further and say manipulation with the uh, plunge protection team that Ronald Reagan created back in 1988 but um, and it's early it's still, still only the first day of March so you know the Ides of March we have the uh, um, the seasonal pattern you've got the vernal equinox coming up the third week of the month and if you look back in recent years there tends to be low points not every year maybe this is the year that's the exception in the uh, around the mid to third week of uh, March. So, you know, maybe there's a surprise coming here, some outlier event. They're still debating in Congress here in the U.S. about budgets. Uh, we still have a lot of, you know, events around the world that could change things very, very dramatically and quickly. Uh, uh, all the bulls out there are disappointed. The Federal Reserve's not lowering rates as they originally thought they were going to do in March. But, uh, you know, maybe it inverted this year and it'll be a high point rather than a low point, but it's a cycle point that we look at. So if we do get a sell-off into mid or late March or April, that would probably be a, another buy point since it is a presidential election year. So to answer your question, uh, we broke out in the um, Russell 2000, which is a broader measure of the market than the S&P 500, which has been, as you know, affected by seven or eight stocks. 
uh, versus the full 190 that weren't doing as well, even though they're catching up a little bit. But the Russell is a good, it was a good catch up type play and there's, it's starting to move a little bit. So, uh, the wind's at the back with that, with in the bull camp right now because of the expectation ultimately the Fed's going to reduce rates. We're not going to, the World War III that has started, nobody really wants to talk about. Uh, is not is not hurting the markets at least not yet, um, and um, you know we do have this presidential cycle coming in, and you know the powers that be want to get reelected, so uh, the market is sort of like I say has the wind behind its back here probably overall for the year or at least until uh, until we get that normal correction in September October every year, and uh, so they just will just you just have to trade them you know, and if you want to be optimistic you hang in there during this presidential cycle year but i would be you know, more concerned afterwards because once uh, the election is determined things could change quickly crude oil is moving higher is it likely to cause more inflation and thus higher interest rates i don't know if it's going to tie to interest rates it may just hold rates where they are right now because i don't know if the fed's going to actually do anything to raise the short-term rate the uh, the bond market might look at it differently. The bond market, the Fed has no control over. That's the free market, and we'll have to wait and see. Um, it's usually, higher crude oil prices is a negative for the stock market because basically it puts a tax on the economy and could slow down earnings. And if you know crude oil really took off here, you know OPEC is still evaluating whether they're going to continue their cutbacks through the whole year. I heard a story. Today, they may reduce production or can decide that they're going to continue doing that through 2024. Um, so that would be a, a bump to the upside in uh, crude oil prices. A lot has to do with geocosmic events, geopolitical events, and so forth. But generally, higher crude oil prices is a tax on the consumer, and that usually is a negative for the stock market. So if you really took off in crude oil here for whatever reason, that would that would be a negative for the stock market on a short-term basis. Bitcoin looks like it's on its way to new highs. What do you see ahead for Bitcoin? Well, I've been telling everyone on this broadcast for a while that Bitcoin's going up, and I even mentioned a number in the 80,000 range as a possibility in the next couple of years. It's sure going fast. It got over, over into the low 60s. So uh, whether it's going to get through the that continue going here, my, you know, my work says it should be topping out here on a short-term basis. The charts tell me that you know if you had a profit in it, which we actually we mentioned in our newsletters, we we have a letter, the uh, blockchain letter, where we talk about all the cryptos and Bitcoin is in there, Ethereum, uh, many of the names. Uh, we try to keep a core position in those because I'm just a big picture near-term bull, you know, bull on the on the crypto market. But short term, uh, we took profits. I said, you know, they had a big run here. Maybe we could scalp it and buy it back a little cheaper. Uh, those are for traders. Those are win it. You know, we talked about this for months, Jim, you know, when um, BlackRock and Larry Fink pressured the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission and uh, to get approval for an ETF for Bitcoin. What was going to happen? As soon as it got it imposed on everyone there, they got the opportunity to buy it before they could do it. And um, asset allocation managers all over the planet, you know, have to have a little piece of this ETF, whether they really like it or not, because they're supposed to be diversified. So that's going to provide, uh, you know, wind at the back for Bitcoin, whether you like it, you don't like it, believe in it, don't believe in it. So uh, as long as those e- look at the ETFs for gold, I talked about this previously as well. GLD was created. That uh, was also wind at the back for the gold market. So um Bottom line is, it, you know, all these markets trade. Gold goes up and down. Bitcoin goes up and down. But the trend basically seems to be higher. So if you're looking to get in it, I think you can probably buy a dip here. I think it's going to pull back a little before it goes higher. But if you've been in it for a while, stay with it. Yeah, I had some discussion with Bob Hoy from a listener question. There used to be a time they said you should have, well, you know, maybe 4% of your portfolio in gold, a little bit of Bitcoin now, should it be 5% Bitcoin and a little bit of gold, or is it up to your personal preference? I guess it's up to yours. I, I don't like the formulas. Remember, we had the 60-40 for years, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, and that went out the window when the bond market got creamed. <laughs> you know, so, you know, rates go up, they kill the bond market. So if you had 60-40, you know, I don't think you, you, your portfolio would have been a lot, wor- a lot worse. You know, owning treasury bills or bonds, Short term for the interest, that's one thing. But if you know, if you go out and he 
length of time, the value of your bonds drop considerably and your portfolio can really take a hit. So on a short-term basis, a 60-40 was probably okay if you just don't, you know, some T-bills or something or one-year notes. But uh, uh, I don't like these formulas, whether it's 60, 40, 5 percent or whatever. It really depends on your risk tolerance and how much you believe in it. So each month, money manager has their own formula about what they think is appropriate. So uh, they look smart if they had a higher allocation and, and or they get criticized if it's uh, you know too low and why didn't you have a bigger position. I'm sure money managers all over the planet you know, missed the AI move and the video was the big hot stock here in the last year and a half, two years. And uh, I'm sure, you know, Many or most managers really didn't participate as they probably would have liked to. So the allocations into high tech versus gold versus crypto versus AI now, how much do you put into AI? I mean, that's a, that's a song of the future here. It's like, uh, you know, the dot coms in the late 1990s, you know, or the internet and the, when that came along, you know, companies were changing their names just to have dot com at the end of them. Now every company wants to have an AI product or talks about AI. I read the, one of the um, franchise companies, and, and I don't want to mention the name because I may have the wrong name, but it's one of like the franchise hamburger companies that you're going to, when you pull out and you get checked out for your burger or whatever, there's, there's going to be an AI component <laughs> in, in processing your, your hamburger or your food product. And uh, they, I'm sure that was done to help support the stock. So everybody wants to have like a dot com at the end of their company name, and now they want AI associated with it. So uh, that gets that's a, that gets a little off the tangent of your question, but it's part of the allocation process. You know, what do they what what do, what do the managers want to do? How much AI do they, do they want to own, and do they want to get caught at the top, which which could happen as it did with the dot com bubble, you know, in the you know, late '90s. Well, there was word Wendy's was going to use AI to bring in surge pricing so they would charge you more at lunchtime or dinner time. And, uh, instant that might back- be it. Yeah. That ba- might be the story I heard. Uh-huh. Yeah. Go ahead. Instant backlash against it. And now they say they're not going to do it. Okay. So it was Wendy's that I know I'd read some hamburger yeah. place was throwing that around, you know, like AI is a solution to all our problems. You know, well, it's crazy. Well, gold had a good move on Friday. You think it's setting up to be much higher. Yeah, I, I think so. It looks good to me. I mean, I'm, I'm just hanging in there with the gold because I'm impressed. I mean, gold's been sitting here above 2000, around the 2000 level for the longest time. And, uh, you know, it just, uh, it just, I know it's being manipulated. It's being suppressed. I can, there's tons of articles that support that. The government interference in the gold market has been documented many times. But I think because so many world governments, particularly Russia, China, and others, and the BRIC nations, want to have a new currency supported by it. So the, the physical gold is being gobbled up, and uh, whatever manipulation uh, is, is being employed here to keep the, da- the price down, it's not going to hold very long. So uh, I'm looking for 2700 but I don't know if, if that's, you know, one year or five years. So, uh, you know, you might make more money... Uh, you know, trading Bitcoin than waiting for gold to go to 2700 <laughs> So, but it still looks higher to me. And yes, I like it and we're in it. Are the Dow Transport an important market to watch? Well, historically, the Dow Transports is a leading indicator for the um, the market. There's a, what is known as the Dow Theory created by Charles Dow, I think it was in the 19th century. And basically it said uh, you want to see the Dow utility average, the Dow transport average, and the Dow industrials all move together. In particular, the transport should lead the way. And when you think about it, that makes sense. If goods and services are being produced and being shipped, particularly the uh, you know, products versus services, you would see it in the transportation of those products. And therefore, those companies would do better. And that would be an indication that business is picking up. So the transport has always been used, at least in the past hundred years or so, as a coincident or leading indicator and it, it was underperforming for, for many many months and it just started to come back to life recently so um for a while it was giving sort of a negative divergence as they call it it wasn't really confirming the kind of up move we've had and the up move we've had in the market as you know was more re- related to technology stocks like you know meta and nvidia you know and um tesla and you know stuff like that and it it, it probably 
the business that the transport companies were involved with that would have generated the higher earnings and prices for those stocks possibly wasn't being reflected because the action was in these technology companies, which maybe didn't use Dow Transport Company services as much. In other words, if you're a railroad, um, you know, you're not shipping, uh, you know, you're shipping coal, you're shipping, you know, cars, heavyweight items, you're not shipping, you know, chips or, you know, things or whatever that's pre- or production items of these high tech companies. If you're Meta, which, which was formerly Facebook and you're doing your business online, how does that help a transport, transportation type company, for example? You know, Netflix, you know, you're producing, uh, movies, but people access that, you know, via video and so forth. But, you know, you don't need a train or a truck to ship it. So, you know, I, I'm sure there are a lot better examples that I could provide the listeners. So maybe that's why the transports were underperforming, but they started recently to catch up a bit. So that was confirmation of the move that we've seen here in the, um, in the Dow Industrials. You want to see more of that to continue a bull market. Your thoughts on the U.S. dollar? I'm sort of neutral on the uh, U.S. dollar here. It, it, it was, it got nailed down. It looked like it was rallying. Now it's starting to pull back a little bit. Uh, it was going up because rates were going up and money was flowing into the U.S. dollar to get benefit of higher rates. And if rates are perceived to be going lower, that would be less reason for the dollar to go up. You know, dollar comes down, that helps commodities, helps gold and so forth. It's been floundering all over the place. Um, generally, there's an adage, and I don't know if it's going to hold true forever, but when in the U.S., when Republicans are in power, uh, the U.S. dollar, you know, tends to be stronger, okay? And under uh, um, Democrats, it, uh, actually, I'm sorry, it's the opposite. With Democrats, it tends to be stronger and the weaker under the uh, Republicans. So uh, maybe the, mar- the, the the pullback we saw here in the dollar recently is an uh, expectation that maybe the power shift is going to occur away from the Democrats to the Republicans. So um, we'll see if that happens. Maybe that's why we've seen uh, the dollar had a big run now it's starting to pull back a, a bit so maybe politically related but um it, it's on, it's it's right in the middle of a range so i don't have a clear trading objective for you but the fact that gold took off today and i believe the dollar was down a little bit is a plus for traders so we'll just have to watch it is the fear greed indicator an important indicator for markets i think so um we actually published that in the newsletter last um week or two um, you can pull it up from the uh, CNN News Network. They have a, a little link to their, they've created a fear uh, indicator in there. When the arrow is all the way up in the top right, which says we're way overdone here on the greed side versus the fear side. So it's too much greed right now. And it's a warning. doesn't mean the market's going to collapse tomorrow, but we're definitely up there. That's why one of the reasons when you, when you asked me this question at the top of the interview about whether I'm bullish or bearish, yes, the index is into new highs, but we're in this time frame where we could get a pullback and everybody's exuberant here. So, you know, we get some outlier events, some you know, surprise news. Uh, there's been a few of those already recently. Uh, market could uh, take a quick nosedive. So but we are on the greed side of that indicator. So you have to be aware of that, where we are in the markets when market was collapsing last September, October, and, uh, Israel got invaded, and all these negatives were telling us be out of the market. It was just the opposite. You needed to be in when all the bad news was there, and everybody was scared, and we were in the fear indicator was on the fear side. So we're on the opposite side of that spectrum now, so you have to be aware of that if you're going to jump in Monday morning and buy stocks. The Chinese New Year is the year of the dragon. Are dragons good for the markets? Well, uh, yes and no. I actually you know, put a little... Uh, note in my um, newsletter about that and i don't know if i can pull it up here where um, while we're on the air or not but basically there's a little comment about what drew the temperament of, of dragons and how that might help you with your um, your question and i it says that the dragon essentially well first of all it, it's this it's celebration time because of the dragon they say it symbolizes power good fortune and strength and is associated with auspicious traits like intelligence, ambition, charisma, and historically linked with imperial power. So Chinese emperors considered themselves descendants of dragons, emphasizing the dragon's esteemed position. So how that relates to the markets this year, um, 
uh, there's a little statistic that we stuck in the um, the website, and it says that basically, well, there's a lot of there's a lot of Chinese animals, as you know, from rabbits all the way to dragons and so forth. You got the snake, horse, sheep, monkey, rooster, dog, pig, rat, ox, and tiger. So, um, according to one study, value stocks do best under years of the dragon, and we're into the year of the dragon right now. So. Growth stocks did less as well. Dividend stocks a little bit better and non-dividend 11%. But at the top, near the top of the list of, of returns is, uh, is a year when the dragon is, is there. So this was a study done by an analyst who compared all the Chinese years to returns on stocks. So, um, there, there is, I, I am scanning it as we're talking right now. Apparently there's also a good year if it's a year of a rooster where they say you can get average returns of 25.6%. Versus a 23% for the dragon. So dragon, I guess, might be in the second place for value stocks. But depending which stocks or groups you're looking at, value, growth, dividend, or non-dividend stocks, dragon is up there as one of the better performing years. So um, it's an interesting study. It's like looking at a lot of the arcane indicators. And I looked at a lot of those, like the January barometer, which we talked about, the Super Bowl indicator, uh, the presidential cycle uh, indicator, these are all arcane indicators, and I guess looking at the um, Chinese New Year and the uh, what year animal you're in, it's just another one of these arcane indicators. You know, you don't want to bet your savings on it, but it, it shows, you know, basically positive returns for a year of a dragon. That's the bottom line answer to your question. If all countries in unison keep printing money with no end in sight, could debt bubbles continue to grow without bursting? I don't know how they can not not burst, but... We've been doing it for a long time, Jim. You know, we're crazy here. Look, look at all the debt and, uh, the West has created. And this is why you've got people like, uh, Klaus Schwab with the World Economic Forum. And, you know, you'll be broke. Uh, you have no money, but you'll be happy. And, um, you know, I think a lot of the conflicts in the world are being stimulated by those who are looking for turmoil so they can change the economic system. And that's why the BRIC nations, I suppose, have gained a lot of momentum and strength here and trying to change what currency is the, the leading currency, not the, not the dollar, perhaps using gold or some other alternate currency. Um, it's, um, you know, it's, it, there is not a straight answer to the question that I can give you, but you know, the bottom line is, uh, the distrust of the dollar and, uh, distrust of the way business is being done. And I think a lot of it is related to the insatiable demand on the part of, the politicians to create more debt without understanding the consequences. They're trying to placate their uh, electorate. And then you've got the other side of the coin. You've got the Federal Reserve here in the U.S., which doesn't create the, the congressional debt, but has its own ability to uh, push a button and create artificial money, <laughs> which even Ben Bernanke, the one of the former Fed chairmen, admitted when he says, yes, we're actually creating money by hitting a button on our computers. So the power of Congress and the power of the Fed to, to create this phony money. I mean, it's just money that has just a computer entry and suddenly there's more money available. You know, Congress says we want to spend, uh, increase the debt. So they just print more money. So what's the basis of that except a computer generated event? It says, okay, you got more cash here. And at some point that's going to destroy the, uh, the currency the, the, and then ultimately destroy the, the, uh, the country. We saw it happen in all kinds of crazy countries around the world, but the, of course the big example would be Germany, you know, and uh, after World War One, and what happened there, it's just um, insane what's going on. And for some reason, it's being masked and down, you know, it's talked down all the time. And, um, and there's even a crazy story that came out, it's not going to happen would retirees in the U.S., for example, forego their Social Security and retirement to help pay down the U.S. debt? And there was a poll taken by AARP, the retirement organization. 86% said absolutely not. Why would you give up your retirement savings to bail out stupid politicians who spent money like drunken sailors for decades? So uh, where's the answer? You know, you have to cut back in expenditures, okay? And you can't be printing money. And some claim, well, paying people their social security you have to print money to give it to them well that's not true because this is money they had contributed to a system that which mis mismanaged it and uh, it should be there for them regardless of anything else 
So a lot of money is being spent on secret programs, activities, supporting alien immigration here in the country. Immigrants come in here across the border illegally. They're given medical care. Some are given money. They're given all kinds of benefits that even uh, U.S. citizens can't uh, obtain. So where's this money coming from? It's the same printing press. It's uh, a lot of people to blame, Jim. I don't have the answer, but the system definitely needs an an enema. There's no question about it. Are the control currencies, the central bank digital currencies, likely to become reality anytime soon? There's a lot of push against it. You know, I'm surprised. I mean, uh, first there was a lot of push for it, and then you're hearing, you know, a lot of politicians saying, no, no, I, I, don't, I have no idea where it's, it's going. You know, the fact that Bitcoin took off and the cryptos have been doing well, you know, shows more support for a digital type transaction. But what, is, is a government going to jump in on a Tuesday morning and say, all oh, your money in your checking account is no longer cash, but the digital currency and, and you can use it as anything else, but it's a digital and you have to use it that way. And you don't, can't use paper money anymore. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a vote against freedom. It, it's really a bad move for us. I mean, having cash and being able to do what you want with your cash privately and not being supervised by a government digital system is a big uh, part of being free. So there's a push against it. And I don't know if it'll succeed or not because government always looking for more control and uh, they're looking for totalitarian type control that's been moving more and more toward that, as you know. So uh, hopefully it fails, but I think it's it's bad for our freedoms. Here's a quote, all wars are bankers' wars. Your thoughts on that? Well, that's been said, and, and, I, and I don't have, you know, I can't prove it, but I, I believe that's true. I think when you talk about industrial military complex that Eisenhower warned us about, you know, uh, the push for wars and military armament and, uh, and so forth, I just think that there's a lot of truth to that. I think, you know, there's money, money behind that to pay for all those arms and uh, the wars that uh, are, you know, re- you know, not resulting of the production of the arms, but are coincident with that. So I would say it's true. And then I know a lot of countries right now are um, preparing for war. I mean, there's a quote here from Newsweek, uh, the commander of the Dutch army, uh, I think the last couple of weeks called for the Netherlands to become better prepared for a potential future war with, uh, with Russia. I mean, why would they do something like that? I mean, they, they, they looking for money. Are they, they really believe they could, they, they can uh, survive against a Russian, um, adversary. Um, just, you know, it's, it's a form of mental illness, honestly. I mean, I really, people don't understand what's really going on. Um, I mean, the war with Ukraine has been a, a disaster. Um, you know, Ukraine's going to lose and it could have been avoided to begin with. And, um, the, you know, Russia is being portrayed uh, ultimate, as the ultimate, you know, negative invader or negative country without, it, it, I think anyone who wants to understand what's going on in Russia have to, has to listen to the uh, interview that um, Putin just had and um, get a better sense of the other side of the coin here. What's really all about is it's, it's NATO good, Russia bad, supposedly. That may not be true, and I don't think that's true. I think a lot of negatives in NATO, like Klaus Schwab with the World Economic Forum, you know, and the demand for more control and the digital currencies that you just had just referred to, and the imposition of freedoms. Look at the, um, uh, was it the farmers in the Netherlands and Germany and others in uh, in Europe, you know, uh, fighting against government control, against growing, uh, you know, growing uh, crops and use of fertilizers and so forth and so on. It's just a mad, mad situation out there about government imposition. And that's, uh, you know, that's NATO. That's, that's the West. So is, is you know, is Russia, uh, as bad as that or better than that? That's really, you have to answer the question. You know, I think the, the I think they want to stand. You're answering a question about bankers and I'm getting off on a tangent. So I'm ranting and raving a little bit, which I apologize for, but. If uh, you want a one-world government under one control, which is what NATO essentially is pushing for, people like Klaus Schwab and so forth, then right, you have to be an ally of Russia because he stands for independence. And China certainly doesn't want to be in a one-world government unless they control the whole world themselves. So um, 
It's an interesting question about the bankers. Yep, a lot of it is related to uh, making money, unfortunately. That's my answer. Are housing markets in trouble? Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, there's a still shortage of supply. Housing stocks have been doing well. The builders are doing well. I look at the charts. I mean, they had a little trading peak here recently, but they really ran up. The anticipation of lower rates, and there will be lower rates temporarily. I'm sure the Fed will lower rates later this year. The political pressure and everything. The question is, will it stay down? It may go down for a few months or a year, and then they may come back in and raise them again. But in this current environment, that should be good for housing. So I would be bullish. Moon, sunspots, and geocosmics, what's the latest? Well, I haven't checked space weather uh, tonight for you. Uh, I suppose I um, I should have. But um, there was a powerful X- X-class solar flare flare that hit uh, the last couple of days and caused uh, blackouts, radio blackouts all over the U.S. West Coast and much of the Pacific Ocean. So th- there was one here in the last couple of days, and they called an X-class lo- solar f- flare. And people sort of downplay this. There's also, as you know, recently just in the news, was it a lot of telephone service? I think it was AT&T service in New York got knocked out. Um, I don't know if this was related to solar flare or was some type of uh, s- internal sabotage, but in terms of the geocosmic, we definitely have risk uh, with the sun and uh, its impact on the planet. And this is very, you know, I'm hearing more and more about it. I've been talking about it for years, and now you're starting to hear some crazy commercials. I would listen to some commercial on TV the other night, and they started off, oh, there's a solar flare. So actually there's some recognition out there that it is a risk factor. Um, you know, of course, as you and I have discussed for the longest time, you get another Carrington event, uh, as we saw in the mid uh, 19th century. Uh, uh, we were in trouble. I mean, in terms of communication equipment being knocked out and, you know, satellites and so forth. And uh, there's been, you know, geologic proof that there was a huge solar event in our distant past, it had been a million years ago, that fried the planet and wiped out all life here. So forget the dinosaurs and the asteroids. There were, the sun itself could uh, knock us for a loop uh, overnight. So there is risk. Nothing we can do about it. We can monitor it. It's like saying an asteroid's going to hit or the we're going to have a planetary shift tomorrow. Nothing we can change or do about it that's going to happen. But it is uh, it is occurring, and it seems to be getting more frequent in terms of blackouts of shortwave radio and uh radio blackouts occurring so maybe you know we're, we're in a solar flare up cycle according to the scientists so the next few years there may be some greater risks here you know where suddenly your internet's gone your radio tv you're down communications are wiped out because of some crazy solar flare which could really impact world uh, the world economy so if something serious happens like that you know food supplies can be become short short supply and transportation communications could be affected. So uh, there are negatives, but like anything else, you can't sit and worrying about it unless you grow your own food or you, you prepare for, a, you know, it's like preparing for a hurricane that doesn't happen, you know, always having stores of food and water around or having backup uh, power supply just in case the uh, unlikely occurs. Are people waking up to the fact of widespread global corruption and the lies we've been fed for decades? I sure hope so. You know, we've been, we've been brainwashed, unfortunately, by a media, and uh, that is, is, you know, I don't want to use the word mentally ill, but that might be the closest way to describe it. Um, um, we, we had a you know, famous um, book about written, you know, decades ago about, uh, you know, mental illness is, uh, you know, the, the, the big problem here. You know, people believing things without doing their homework and checking out uh, the details. Michael Savage is most noted for that for that book. Um, so um, yeah, you know, I think you know how far can the uh, universities go in brainwashing kids, uh, Jim? You know, and will the realization ultimately come to them that they're not being told the truth and their the news is being uh, edited to the benefit of the, the the media's, I guess, the media's involvement with the government, you know, or whatever they're perception is of the real world fortunately we do a lot of research you and i do research we look at other sources we do our own homework but there's an ignorance ignorance level unfortunately in the public the mass public they don't do their homework they believe what they hear and read on tv 
And um, that's why we have Joe Biden as president of the United States. And this is why we have, you know, problems that we have, open borders and situations which uh, normal intelligence would say you, you just don't, you don't allow, you know. So uh, this is, uh, I think it's the, uh, the dumbing of the masses, unfortunately, has gone to an extreme. And hopefully it uh, changes, I guess, if enough negative things happen and uh, and hurts the um, quote-unquote liberal viewpoint or perspective and they just try to vote or, or vote differently and change things, maybe we'll get back to a more of a centrist view of the world. And But that, you know, the, the, you're asking me this question, it's not market-related, I'm just expressing a personal opinion. Do you see a bright future ahead for America and the world? You have to be optimistic. I mean, look, you know, in my own lifetime, look at all the negative events that have occurred. You know, I got drafted into the, for the Vietnam War, War decades ago. Um, fortunately, I got kicked out. <laughs> I had a 4F rating after I went in for an induction. I may not be here today if I went to Vietnam and actually uh, fought. But look at all the negative wars and crises we have. Yeah, somehow we seem to... Uh, pull out of it i mean all the world wars and then now we have the uh bacterial war with uh, covid and we've got you know all this stuff going on on the planet um and it seems like you know when i was a kid i remember somebody telling me you know don't watch news don't read the newspapers just go about your life and you'll have less stress and when you think about it i remember even when i was a kid growing up in florida during the 1950s and 60s everybody uh, was told, oh, you got to rush and build a bomb shelter. The nuclear war is going to come any day, and you got to build a shelter and build it right away. And I must have been in my uh, teenage years or even earlier than that when I heard that story. So there's all, all kinds of reasons. And even the solar flare story that we just talked about, uh, life goes on. So uh, even, you know, dinosaurs got wiped out, the earth <laughs> repopulated with mammals and Ultimately, uh, we all came back, and we also we also know there's probably high civilizations that were on this planet millions of years ago, or hundreds of thousands of years ago that got wiped out. The old st- story of Atlantis is probably the best example, but there's probably high civilization that got wiped out by natural catastrophe or by wars, and somehow uh, man survives, comes back, and rebuilds. So the answer is uh, you have to be optimistic. Where can people find out more about your special offer? Go to well, go to vrtrader.com, and I'm telling you about it, so you don't need to see it on the website because it's not actually posted there. But go to vrtrader.com, and our special offer is buy any of our newsletters, including our new annual forecast model, for fifty percent off using the promo code twenty twenty two half off. Mark, thank you so much for being on this week in money. Thanks for having me, Jim. It was a long interview. Thanks for the thanks for the time. My guest has been Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. He was speaking to us from Arizona. Coming up, Wolf Richter, next on This Week in Money. Recyclical, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium-ion last forever. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He's speaking to us from glorious San Francisco. Welcome back to the show, Wolf. Thanks for having me back, Jim. Wolf, what do you see ahead for inflation and interest rates? Well, we just got our uh, latest batch of inflation data in the United States. So uh, we have two sets of inflation data. One is the Consumer Price Index, the CPI, that came out early in February. And the second one, which is the one that the Fed favors, is the PCE Price Index. And uh, that came out today. And... Um, and it was almost funny. It was so bad. 
um, the core services inflation index in there, so those are all services except energy services, uh, that spiked uh, month to month by the worst rate in 22 years. And uh, we're now running it over 7% annualized. And that's, uh, yeah, that's where uh, consumers spend the majority of their money is services, uh, these core services. And inflation has gotten entrenched in that. They moved from goods. In, uh, so initially, inflation was really bad in goods in 2021 and early 2022, and including motor vehicles and, and, and fuel, too, and those kinds of things. Food, all this stuff spiked, and in, in uh, starting in mid uh, 2022 and 2023, uh, these goods prices cooled, and and uh, many of them actually fell, including used vehicles that fell by a whole bunch, and they're less expensive now than they were. Uh, food prices, uh, inflation cooled off. So in in the goods uh, sector, inflation has calmed down, and uh, durable goods are running at negative rates. Uh, so this is this is really encouraging. It brought overall inflation down, energy prices collapsed, so that helped. And now we've got this this inflation in core services. That's I've been uh, uh, lamenting it for months. So that really it cooled off for a while, and then it got stuck at relatively high levels. And now it accelerated. It accelerated by a whole bunch in January, and we've seen that confirmed in other data. So services, we're talking about healthcare, insurance, financial services, uh, travel, transportation services, all kind of things, and and food services, it's restaurants, uh, accommodation services. I mean, it's it's a big bunch of uh, things, and uh, it, it it's just ridiculous how suddenly they took off after already being fairly hot. And uh, the Fed has warned about this, and um, they're, they've, they were on a wait-and-see approach uh, because they're leery of this core services inflation, the head fakes that it produces, and, and now we're getting that. And it's, it's really almost funny uh, how bad it was. It just, com- just spiked and from already high levels. And uh, so <laughs> yesterday, in anticipation, we heard one of the first Fed governors mention that uh, she might um, actually go for a rate hike, that that's uh, not off the table for her. If inflation gets worse, well, it got worse, so... Uh, the rate cut expectations that a couple of months ago people expected there to be six rate cuts in 2024 starting in January. Well, they're off the table. We might get one or two cuts late in 2024 if things go pretty well, and we may not get get any rate cuts at all if inflation keeps going like this and the Fed's going to start warning about it's going to move the rate cut scenario off the uh, off the immediate horizon, and and eventually, it, if it keeps going like this, we'll see uh, rate hikes coming back on the horizon, and and they'll be talking about that. So the economy in the, in the United States has just been been hot, been running hot, and we've that's been confirmed the second half last year all around. And this is just and the financial conditions are really super loose. All of this stuff in, in government spending, our government spending out the wazoo. We do deficit spending uh, as if it were in in a deep recession. I mean, it is ridiculous how much uh, money the government borrows and spends, and and this all this fuels inflation. And so now we have this inflation. We have a government fiscal policy that's very inflationary. We have financial conditions that are very inflationary. Uh, we have consumer demand that's inflationary. We've got wage increases that are substantial and have outrun inflation in 2023, and, and that's inflationary. So, yeah, I, don't, I just don't see how inflation in the United States can cool off at, at this rate, and I don't really see how the Fed can significantly cut interest rates in this scenario. It, I mean, the Fed obviously can do whatever it wants to do. It doesn't have to listen to me. But I just don't uh, don't see that rate cut scenario at all. If if inflation stays on this track, I think it is much more likely that uh, the Fed's going to start uh, moving the rate cuts off the table for 2023, uh, 2024 and uh, might start talking about rate hikes again. Has working from home pulled the rug out from under the office sector of commercial real estate? Yeah, that, that has happened. And... Um, Obviously, it 
it, it was set up to happen in a sense because uh, all these big companies and startups too and every company with money, uh, they started hogging uh, office space before the pandemic uh, because there was a perceived office shortage. So anytime something came on the market of quality, uh, companies jumped on it and leased it even though they didn't need it and they expected to grow into it. And then working from home became a reality. And some of it is getting backed off, but it's, it's, it's hybrid situations now where you work in the office part of the time. And you just don't need all that office space that was sitting vacant uh, before the pandemic. And so now their uh, companies are shedding the space and uh, they're putting it on the sublease market. Landlords are uh, defaulting on the loans. Uh, they're forcing lenders so that's mostly investors not the banks uh they're forcing lenders uh into negotiations to to restructure the loans to extend them uh to uh, to make it more possible for them uh to to continue leasing the office rather than letting the uh, letting the property go back uh, to the lenders. And in many cases, we have seen that's exactly what landlords have done. They've just walked away from the property and, and uh, lenders are stuck with the loan and they and, and the property, so they get to sell it at, at a huge loss. And uh, th- this has been going on for months and it's getting worse. Finally, we're getting some office transaction action. So uh, we're, get, we're seeing a price level and it's much, much lower. It's uh, these prices are down 50 to 70 percent. That's kind of what we're seeing, and some of them a lot more. And, and these older office buildings. That's really the older office towers that are the problem, not the the newest office towers. There's a flight to quality, and the newest office towers are in pretty decent shape. But uh, even though they also struggle with uh, with interest rates, and uh, obviously a higher interest rate uh, devalues the uh, uh, the the price of a of a of an office tower, and that's happening to new buildings too. But in terms of walking away from loans, we haven't seen that with new buildings. That's that's older office towers, and it's happening around the country. It ha- it's happening in every market, um, and and these investors are having to sell those those foreclosed properties, and and it's it's a real mess, and it's not going. It's not getting better. This has to be solved. Uh, structurally, so we have to eventually uh, either convert some of those office towers into residential. There are only a few office towers, really, that that can be done with. And with uh, a lot of other office towers that were built in the 1980s, uh, that that can't be converted. And, and and so they have to be torn down, and they'll be sold for the, the value of the land. Will future office towers take into account that someday they may be turned into condos, so they'll have the plumbing and the wiring to accommodate that? Well, that's an interesting thought. I I don't think anybody's in the mood to to build a lot more office towers right now. Um, it it's just just off the top of my head, I think it would just increase the price of building an office tower by a lot if you if you put in the uh, the plumbing and, and all the other stuff, the windows that can be opened and, and all the things that you need in a residential uh, building, I think that would make the office tower very expensive. In addition, the biggest problem is the footprint of these towers. Uh, residential towers have to have windows for each apartment, for each unit. So these, these square footprints of these big, massive office towers with square footprints, you could only have... Windows in the outside apartments and the inside apartments uh, wouldn't have any window windows, so you could maybe put in an air shaft or something in the middle. And, and, and I, I think that's been done already, that you get an apartment with view of an air shaft. And, uh, but I, I don't – so I think that would be the, the primary consideration to build a footprint that can be converted – and uh, I mean, if you want to put in the plumbing for condos uh, in advance, I mean, you, I guess you could. It would raise the price by a whole lot. Uh, I would just say build the condo because there is demand for residential, and uh, there's growing populations. We the residential is running into problems too because of the high interest rates. But there's at least demand. There's no structural problem for residential for for residential properties. There's a resi- there's a structural problem for for office properties. Is the Chinese real estate crisis spilling over into North America? Oh, yeah. We in San Francisco have a huge mega project, the Oceanwide 
project that was uh, started by the Chinese uh, real estate development firm Oceanwide, and uh, it's a two billion dollar project. It's huge. It's got two big office towers and some other buildings. And uh, the Oceanwide is in liquidation collapse. Uh, the building uh, is in bankruptcy in the United States. Um, they they raised it to to grade level, so at least it's not a hole anymore. They the the concrete work has been uh, completed up to grades, up to street level. And I have some pictures of it on my website. It it is just a big altar in the middle of San Francisco in an expensive part of San Francisco. It's a huge project, and it's across cat, catty corner from the Salesforce Tower, which is the largest building we have. And um, it does a uh, ocean wide project in San Fran- in uh, Los Angeles uh, that has been halted a few years ago. That's much more completed. It's still not finished, but it is much better shape than ours here. And um, there are other projects like that. We have some condo towers here in in San Francisco done by by, by Chinese firms, and and they're smaller, but uh, uh, they're in trouble. And so uh, Manhattan has an office tower in, in the works, or had in the works. Uh, uh, that was an ocean wide project. And so yeah, we we've got these these Chinese projects that failed uh, all over the country, and. Um, nobody really knows what to do with this stuff. It'll, it, like this ocean-wide uh, uh, ulcer that we have in San Francisco, that'll, it'll, it's already been stuck in, at that level for a, couple, for a few years, and it will be several more years before, anyone, before that gets resolved and anyone starts working on it again. And since part of it is office and part of it is condo and part of it is a hotel, uh, and and uh, yeah, and then there was this deem that none of it makes economic sense in San Francisco at the prices that we're thinking. It's going to be very hard to complete too. So the, and these these are big issues. These are big urban issues. We've got this massive ulcer in in a in a big part in an important part of San Francisco, and it it'll stay there for for maybe a decade. Yeah, this is uh, this is the kind of stuff that a uh, collapse uh, of of a real estate. Uh, industry uh, entails do we need to worry about the banks well in terms of commercial real estate and that's what we're talking about here in the united states um most of the the office uh lending was done by investors and not by the banks so uh these are commercial mortgage-backed securities so a lot of these mortgages have been securitized and sold to investors they're uh uh, uh pension funds, the private equity funds, there are PE firms that have invested in these, there are mortgage REITs, um, the collateralized loan obligations that, that uh, contain some of these mortgages. Um, so so the, the mortgages of, uh, the office mortgages are spread far and wide among investors. And these are global investors, not just United States investors. Um, there are these pension funds are all over the world that bought U.S. real estate. And these are they, they bought real estate in the prime markets in San Francisco, in Manhattan, in Los Angeles, thinking that owning commercial real estate, office uh, real estate in these markets would be like printing money and uh, like a gold mine. And uh, that turned out to be the biggest mistake. I mean, these are nightmare buildings now. And uh, uh, there are also banks involved, uh, not just U.S. banks, but international banks are all part in with hard from the Japanese, from a Japanese bank that has huge losses on its book on on office loans in the United States, we've heard already regulars war, regulators warning about the big Canadian banks that invested in office real estate in the United States. Uh, Chinese banks are involved. European banks. I mean, Deutsche Bank has warned already about it. So uh, this is spread far and wide uh, around the world. And uh, Fitch came out with a report on uh, a bunch of small U.S. banks. In the United States, we have some really, really big banks like J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and and so forth. And then some medium-sized regional banks. And then we've got about 4,000 smaller banks. And uh, so these banks, uh, Fitch came out, uh, the list of this report he came out with said there's about close to 50 banks that are really small, that the uh, average has about $1.3 billion in assets. So compared to 
uh, over three trillion dollars in assets for J.P. Morgan. So these are minuscule little banks, and uh, there are about 50 of them that are heavily exposed to office uh, mortgages uh, and and have had losses. And that some of them, some of those small banks, some of those 40 small banks or 50 small banks uh, may eventually end up toppling. And, of course, when a small bank like that topples, it's just a blip. It doesn't really matter. Um, there is uh, not any worry about contagion. By contrast, uh, SVB, the uh, Silicon Valley Bank, when it toppled, it had uh, something like $220 billion in assets. So it, it would require something like 200 of these small banks uh, to topple to equate uh, one Silicon Valley bank. And that's not going to happen. So in an individual bank failure of that size, I, yeah, that's, that's what the FDIC, our regulator and uh, deposit insurer, uh, takes care of that. And uh, it'll, it'll go pretty smoothly. We've already had a few of those smaller bank failures also in 2023, and nobody even pays any attention to that. What's the latest on the housing bubbles in Canada and the U.S.? Well, Canada is ahead of us, that's for sure. Uh, home prices in house prices in Toronto are, are down about 20% from the peak. Uh, they're, they're at around a two-year low. Um, prices in other Canadian cities are down a little less. Calgary is, doing, is, is sitting at new highs, kind of the exception there of the major cities, major markets. Uh, in the United States, it's all over the place. Miami and some other big cities have hit new highs. We've got a whole bunch of smaller, uh, low-dollar cities in the middle of the country where prices have, have shot up. But on the West Coast, we've seen some substantial damage to home prices, including in San Francisco, uh, including in Seattle and Portland, and less so in Southern California, but uh, further north on the West Coast, it's, it's all over the place in Denver, too, Phoenix, Las Vegas. There we're looking at substantial uh, price declines. Um, mortgage rates in the United States have, have come down from their, their uh, high in, in, in October last year. The, the 30-year fixed rate was at 8% at that point. It then, uh, among this, this uh, rate cut mania, uh, the, the mortgage rate then dropped to about 6.5% uh, by late uh, 2023. And, and so there was the hope that that, that would instantly uh, boost home prices and sales. But sales collapsed. Uh, uh, existing home sales are way down, uh, down 25% from the pre-pandemic times. And um, now the mortgage rates are back over 7%. The rate cut mania has, is, is cooling off, and uh, inflation looks to be stubborn. So um, I think we, we will continue to see home prices and uh, struggle. We, we'll see some of the new highs that we had. They'll, they'll turn around. And... Um, uh, every market does this in the, on its own pace, so it, it doesn't doesn't go in lockstep. And uh, you, you, it's really tough to have um, a housing price boom with these kinds of mortgage rates. Does the lowering of prices on new homes cause a ripple effect in the existing home market? And so we certainly have this arbitrage, uh, and it's not just new homes, it's also rental homes. And so so we have this, this housing market that's really... Uh, Three pillars. And we're talking about single-family houses here now. So single-family houses for sale uh, that are older, that, that are existing homes. Uh, single-family ha- houses for sale that are brand new, sold by the builders, and then single-family houses for rent. And uh, the the interesting thing is that uh, these rental homes that are uh, rented out by big landlords, big institutional landlords, are are targeted to uh, renters of choice, as they're called. So these are people with money, like uh, invitation homes. Their uh, median tenant income, household income of the median tenant is $150,000. So that's, that's close to double the rate of the United States overall. And uh, so they're going after uh, people, after families who want to rent a nice house and save money over buying it. And they said that they're, so they're, they're, they're renting nice homes. There are, many of them were built for rent, so they're, they're, some of them are brand new. Um, and they're saying that uh, a, a tenant can roughly save 
uh, $1,200 a month compared to owning the same house in terms of monthly uh, payments, mortgage payments, insurance, and property taxes. And that uh, $1,200 savings per month is pretty substantial, and a lot of these renters for choice are doing exactly that. They're arbitraging that, and uh, they're staying out of the buying market, and they're renting to sit this out, save some money, and, and let this wash out. We've, so that's, that's what we're seeing there. Then uh, a lot of people that are now buying a new house uh, have shopped existing homes and have found that they can buy an equivalent new house for uh, the same or lower payment. And the reason is that home builders have uh, they've cut prices. They've, they're building at lower price points. They're, they're reducing the amenities, and they're buying down the mortgage rates. And these are often permanent mortgage rate buy-downs. And, uh, and the mortgage rate buy-downs buy have the effect that the house price, even though it's more expensive than, uh, than an existing home, that the, the uh, th- that this house price can be financed at a lower monthly payment. And uh, so sales of, exi- of existing homes have, have plunged and sales of uh, new houses uh, have held up pretty well and are running close to the levels before the pandemic. So uh, there is definitely this arbitrage going on in the market. And uh, the rental houses, you know, their their rents are going up. There's that, strong demand for, for those houses and rents are going up. And um, so all of this is bleeding uh, potential bias out of the existing home market. And that's why volume has so much plunged there, down 25%, because some people are buying new houses and some people are, are renting equivalent houses and they're both saving money. And um, and it's really not going to, to change. It's going to continue until home sellers, so people, homeowners, they want to sell until they come to grips with this reality and they're, they're lowering the prices and becoming more competitive. And that usually happens after a while, uh, but it's just just in the beginning stages now. In theory, with the significant increase in mortgage rates, what should the corresponding percentage drop in home prices be? Well, that's not uh, a lockstep equation. Uh, there is a strong uh, historical correlation between mortgage rates and, and home price changes. And um, uh, in the sense that I, when mortgage rates increase, home prices uh, decline, and meaning home mortgage rates increase over a significant period of time, not just a, a little bit. They they increase and decrease every day. You know, they, they go up and down every day. But when they uh, increase over a significant period of time, eventually home prices will follow uh, in, in, in the opposite direction. They, they will decline because buyers have to make the mortgage payments work. And so there's this, this demand problem. Uh, the, the bigger issue there is when home prices increase, volume falls. And um, there are fewer deals made. It's harder to sell a home. And then if you want to sell it, that's when, when you have to make a deal. And uh, so so that's the relationship there. Um, there are other issues involved in inflationary times, which is now we have higher uh, growing wages. So uh, <laughs> if if home prices decline over the next few years, 20%, and wages go up uh, on average 20%, and we're, we're 40% closer <laughs> To being affordable than we were uh, earlier, and um, so this this wage factor is uh, also has a correlation with home prices, and uh, and it's a it's a significant contributor to home prices. So if you have big wage increases, that allows for home prices uh, to go up, and uh, we've seen that, and um, and and this is probably going to happen again that. Uh, in my home price may not go up, but it 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 uh, the, the the increasing wages will put a floor underneath how far home prices can drop. But at some point, they become affordable again, and people will buy it. I, depending on wage inflation, that that could be years from now. But a, a rising uh, median incomes uh, make uh, reduce the affordability. Uh, a crisis that we now have over many years. That doesn't happen in one or two years, but it happens over many years. So even if home prices stay flat and we have continued inflation after many years, uh, they're somewhat reasonably affordable. How far into a housing bust does the waterfall price drop usually happen? 
wonderful price drop. <laughs> okay, uh, we don't have a lot of housing bus, uh to uh, to to speak of here, we have one significant housing bust in the United States, so that's not a great example, uh, a great sample. I mean, a sample of the size of one. Uh, there were uh, there are a lot of local housing busts around the country, and all the time, and and uh, they they happen because of the local economy, and uh, they're unrelated to national things, and. Uh, uh, yeah, there. When, when you have a local economy crash, and I went through that in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, back in the 1980s, uh, it's there, there really is no there, there, the the only fundamental principle at work here is that the people uh, with good jobs uh, that have money they leave, and in Tulsa, what happened is all the oil companies moved the headquarters to Houston. Tulsa was called the oil capital of the world back then in the 70s. And so uh, the major oil companies had the headquarters there, and they moved it to Houston in the 1980s. And they took all these people with them, and employment plunged. And these are the highest paid jobs in Tulsa back then. And and uh, and it it just it it just caused an, just chaos in the city essentially. Yeah, you know, it, it just that this much money leaving, this much employment leaving. There, uh, the, the people left. Um, the young people left, didn't come back. There's nothing to do for them. Uh, and so the housing bust was huge. It took many decades. Houses are still cheap, there, even though they've spiked up 100% over the past couple of years. But they're still cheap in Tulsa. And uh, they they collapsed and stayed low for, for decades. And so each individual market has its own, it, its own dynamic. And uh, what really happens overall in the nation is that enough of these these individual markets come together to average the uh, uh, housing price decline uh, across the nation. And yeah, the, these price declines can happen slowly and then suddenly there's a big drop and then uh, for a period and then they, they go back into declining slowly or staying low and uh, that's kind of what we saw in Tulsa back then. There were several waves of drops and and uh, each each was caused by a different thing, you know. So one of the ways I remember that's when I bought my condo is when when the banks were when the local banks uh, we had a lot of local banks back then in the 80s when they collapsed and the FDIC took over the uh, the banks and they ended the FDIC ended up with the foreclosed homes and then the FDIC started selling them and I bought my condo from a from a bank that then collapsed. And then my neighbor bought his condo from the FDIC, <laughs> and he paid a lot less money than I did. So um, it uh, so that was the that was the that was the the next wave is the FDIC selling uh, thousands and thousands of properties that that banks had foreclosed on, and um, and then there there's more waves, and it it just. It, it just keeps on going until finally it doesn't drop any further, and then eventually it just sits there, the prices, and eventually they, they might rise again. But we're looking at, you know, totally now it's been 40 years. So um, housing markets can be really tough for a very long time. Do stock markets love money printing? Oh, absolutely. That's uh, that, that's the favorite thing, and and um, it, it there's a direct correlation, really, not in lockstep, but uh, – Money printing, so quantitative easing and and asset prices, uh, stock prices included. Uh, it it's just like the best thing that ever happened for markets when when the central bank started printing money during the pandemic and and then also during the financial crisis and uh, threw trillions of dollars at markets that that then start chasing around. And uh, it I mean it's 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 uh it's a it's sort of a flow and, and it it swirls around this money that it goes from one because every every buyer has to have a seller on the other side so the the buyer gives the seller the money and then the seller does something with it and buys something else and so it's it circulates around and and it creates a, an enormous amount of printed money this created money creates an enormous amount of momentum in asset prices and uh, of course, now we have the opposite. We have quantitative tightening, and um, home prices have dropped, and and stocks have reached new highs. But it's uh, they're just a little bit up from where they were two years ago. So it's it's not like uh, that they've boomed, you know. And 
and they've reached new highs recently on, on, on it seems like on some misconception about these rate cuts and uh, and also there is so much liquidity in the markets from all this quantitative easing back then uh, that it will take quite a while to burn off and uh, the, you know the Fed and the Bank of Canada, the European Central Bank, they're all draining this liquidity at a pretty good pace um, but it, there's just so much of it and, and so it's like like the pig in the python, you know, it, it, it takes it takes a while to go through, and uh, so yeah, I, the opposite of quantitative easing of money printing is not good for stocks, it's not good for asset prices, and um, that's the reverse of that coin, and 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 yeah, so the stock market would like nothing better than for the the Fed to flip flop and start printing money again. Does quantitative tightening cause recessions? So my gut feeling is that no, it doesn't. We, we've had quantitative easing and it didn't cause an economic boom either. It causes asset prices to inflate. So it, it didn't really cause a lot of economic activity uh, during the, the uh, years after the financial crisis when we had lots of quantitative easing. The economy was growing, but at very, very, very moderate rates. And uh, during the pandemic, uh, after the initial bounce off, uh, from the from the collapse, the economy was growing, uh, sort of recapturing it. But the, the the quantitative easing, the trillions of dollars that that they weren't really supporting uh, the economy. The low interest rates were so zero percent interest rates are supportive of economic growth, but in government spending, government deficit spending is supportive of of economic growth. But uh, money printing itself that goes into asset prices, so asset prices inflate. That has Maybe a secondary impact on 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 the economy when uh, people feel wealthier. It maybe they spend a little more, but that relationship, the so-called wealth effect, that is pretty tenuous and uh, hasn't really hasn't really been been proven that well. I mean, there's some studies that show that it works a little bit, but uh, a lot of it is is just asset price inflation that doesn't go anywhere else. Mercedes-Benz and Audi are backing away from their electric vehicle production goals. Is this a concern for the growth of the electric vehicle fleet? Well, there's there's two things here. One, uh, production of EVs is a brand new thing. And uh, these legacy automakers, they don't have the supply chain set up. And they've all got, they've got all kinds of problems. And yeah, even Tesla... From the first day on, it overpromised uh, production goals. It could never meet the production goals it announced in time. It eventually meet, met them and surpassed them, but, but years later. And um, it, that's how it is when you start something brand new. The supply chains are very different, and they're not, uh, they're not big enough uh, to switch that much production over to EVs. The, the most popular model globally is an electric vehicle. It's the Tesla Model Y. Um, there is huge demand for EVs. There's growing demand for EVs. Uh, there are production problems. And um, there are quality problems with some of the legacy automakers. I mean, Ford has that issue uh, several times on its F-Series uh, electric uh, truck and, and on the Mach-E Mustang. Um, then there are problems with the legacy automakers in that they have dealers in the United States. They're, they're, these dealers are protected by franchise laws, by state franchise laws, and automakers cannot sell directly uh, to the customers. And Tesla made a, got an exemption from, from that, from these uh, state franchise laws in, in a whole bunch of states, and it's selling direct, and some other st- startups are selling direct uh, to customers. But the legacy automakers cannot do that. They have to sell EVs to the dealers. And they have a dealer rebellion against EVs on their hands. So about half of Ford dealers essentially refuse to to get into the EV program. And uh, it is really hard for an automaker to sell EVs when the dealers that they depend on refuse to sell them. And that's the situation that the, the U.S. automakers are facing. The GM dealers have a similar issue. Uh, that, that a bunch of them refused to sell EVs, and, and, and GM bought out a bunch of these dealers and um, Buick dealers, Cadillac dealers that refused to sell EVs. 
And, and so that's, that's a huge issue. If you're depending on your dealer network and your dealer network is rebelling against EVs, then EV sales are not going to be very good for these legacy automakers. And the issue there is that a customer comes in and wants to buy a pickup truck and the salesman is, is not really uh, into EVs and, and then the, the customer is wanting to look at an EV truck and, and, and then the salesman steers him to an, an, an ICE truck and sells an ICE vehicle and the EV truck sits on the, uh, sits on the lot. And uh, this is kind of, this is cannibalizing. So th- these EVs are cannibalizing the legacy automakers on sales. And so they're, they're in a really, really, really tough spot and the dealers are rebelling against it. The automakers kind of don't like it because yeah, the sales are not going up when they sell more EVs. The sales may be the same, and and uh, they they don't have really much to gain from that. At the same time, Tesla sales are up dramatically. The EV, the pure EV companies are, are doing well in terms of the bigger ones. Uh, the the Korean uh, uh, automakers have jumped on that, and they also have supply chain problems. They also have trouble uh, building enough, and um, and so the the, the German automakers uh, have run into the same supply chain issues, and, and in the United States, they run into the same issues with the dealers. Also, have dealer networks in in Europe. They in Germany, they can sell direct some of them, but uh, here they can't. And so they're facing the legacy automakers are facing all kinds of issues here, uh, selling EVs in the United States, and um, and Tesla is running them over. Yeah, that's, that's just what's happening. Uh, I've been waiting for years for these legacy automakers to, to knock Tesla off its perch. And, and that's just not happening. And, and they don't have their own uh, uh, wide-ranging charging network like Tesla has. So they're making deals with Tesla to, to allow uh, their EVs to be charged at, Tesla, at Tesla's uh, charging network. And... Um, it's it's that kind of issue. Yeah, you know, they're they're these legacy automakers are ten years behind Tesla. They've completely dropped the ball. Toyota doesn't even hardly have anything. I mean, that's that's the the number one automaker in the world, and it's completely dropped the ball. And of course, they they got rid of their their uh, CEO a year ago, and uh, the anti EV CEO. They uh, they retired him, and and there's a new guy there, and they're starting to catch up. And Toyota, if it eventually gets it it stuck in a row it'll be very tough to to compete with but it's so far behind tesla and uh it, it's just it bet on its hybrid technology and hybrids are great but they're ice vehicles they're not evs and it bet on its uh hydrogen technology and and hydrogen is just uh it's the worst gas out there. It, it, it's a bitch to deal with. The technology is great. I mean, hydrogen vehicles are great, but the gas is a terrible thing to deal with, and it's expensive, and uh, it's hard to just hard to deal with all around. And and so uh, he, he, these legacy automakers are just are just having all kinds of difficulties in the EV market, and and they're not being rewarded. You got to remember, they're not being rewarded when they're selling an EV because it, that cannibalizes the ICE vehicle sales. Whereas Tesla and the straight EV makers are being rewarded when when they sell an EV because that's an additional sale for them. So uh, I, I've 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 come to despair uh, about the the executives at these companies and uh, how they have screwed up. Uh, the, the 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 transition to EVs for for years they could drop the ball and now they're trying to catch up and they're making all these mistakes all the way along and um, and and they can't get the dealer networks to support them and and so it, it, they have a dealer network that's rebelling against EVs so I don't know how they ever will will succeed in that and. And I mean, it wouldn't bother me one bit for Ford to to go bankrupt. You know, they 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 can't manage themselves out of a paper bag, and um, it, it the, the kind of executive mistakes that are being made by these companies that it's it's almost funny. And uh, I mean, Ford got rid of some of its its sedans, all nearly all of its sedans, because it didn't want to compete, and it, it focused on trucks because they're and SUVs because they're high profit margin. They abandoned that that sector to Toyota and foreign uh, makers, and, and the, it has some good cars. The Ford Fusion was a great car. had had a hybrid version that's really good. Um, and and you know Ford just decides to walk away, and and so the sales 
in the United States of these legacy automakers, total unit sales, uh, ICE vehicles and EVs, have dropped down a whole bunch from the peak in 2015, 2016. And, and it's... They, yeah, you know, they they had it coming. They they deserve it, and it, they they were going after high dollar units. They were trying to to make vehicles for rich people, but they're not that many rich people in the United States. They're trying to maximize the profit instead of volume. They they're trying to dodge competition with the import makers, and uh, they're trying to to completely blow off EVs for decades. And so now there are the consequences. And yeah, and, and Mercedes and Audi in the United States have done the same boat. And even though in Europe, EVs are taking off uh, uh, and they're having to compete with the Chinese automakers there, uh, they're, uh, the, the Chinese automakers in Europe have gained a significant market share with EVs. And, um, and maybe that's where it's going, that European automakers can't compete with the Chinese automakers in and so that's another interesting to watch. I mean, the, the, the Europeans are starting to put up trade barriers to these, uh, are trying to put up trade barriers to these uh, uh, Chinese-made electric vehicles coming in. Well, BYD, the Chinese electric car maker, is now outselling Tesla. And a lot of people say electric vehicles aren't sexy enough. Well, BYD has developed the Yang Wang U9, which has nearly 1,300 horsepower and is designed to compete directly with Lamborghini and Ferrari. Top end, 192 miles an hour or 309 Ks. It'll hit 60 miles an hour in 2.3 seconds, 97 Ks for people here in Canada. Uh, is that one of the problems that uh, other car makers haven't even looked at? Like how marketable are these electric vehicles to the high end market? Well, they're clearly marketable because that's the the first EVs that were sold were high end vehicles. So Tesla started out that way, and and its its performance version of the Model S uh, has been doing this 2.5 second zero to 60 uh, for many years. And um, you know, GM bragged about its its truck that that got a thousand horsepower EV truck, electric truck, you know, a thousand horsepower, whatever that can do this massive truck that can do zero to 60 in something three seconds or whatever. But these are ridiculous concepts uh, that in, in a sense, you know, because you, you, as a, as a major automaker, you can't make a living selling a hundred or 200 or a thousand specialty made vehicles like that. And Tesla just announced its own roadster uh, with, you know, similar, uh, um, uh, performance, and, and, and he, he must claim that uh, it can do zero to sixty in one second. And uh, but electric motors are that way; they're small and they're incredibly powerful, and they have a flat torque curve. So uh, if you you can put a thousand horsepower into into a passenger vehicle, no problems with electric motors. I mean, it, that's not the issue. You can put two thousand horsepower into it. The electric motors are just small and incredibly powerful, and um, they're incredibly good for acceleration because of the flat torque curve. You don't have to rev them up. They have they have a torque. They have maximum torque eventually, right from the beginning at, at low RPMs, and and so it's it's not that hard to to build these incredibly high performance vehicles with electric motors. You, obviously, you have to have you have some issues with the battery overheating and things like that that you have to manage very well, and 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 they have the experts doing that, and they've they've got that licked pretty well. But that's not the market. I mean, these are toys uh, for rich people, and uh, I mean it's great that they're playing with that and and getting in the headlines with that stuff. But it's really irrelevant. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that. Uh, EV makers can come up with a $25,000 electric vehicles in the United States because that's the sweet spot. And uh, there's not many vehicles that you can buy today, ICE vehicles for that price. You could buy an electric vehicle, a Bolt, for $20,000. Uh, and uh, But now that went out of production. And uh, so right now there there really isn't any vehicle uh, that that's – that Americans like to drive, not the kind of boxes, but but you know, a comfortable middle class vehicles that you can sell for twenty thousand dollars, a new one. And so the the sweet spot is down there, and EVs will make that possible because they're cheaper to build, and they're simpler, and um, 
the battery is pretty expensive, but the prices are coming down. Um, so, yeah, that's that's where the mass uh, volume vehicles are. If you want to sell 10 million vehicles a year, uh, you, it, it can't be the high end uh, globally. You know, it, it it has to be the mass market, and the mass market is a broad range. But the the bottom of the mass market in the United States right now is around twenty thousand dollars, and um, and that's really that would be an incredible feat for EVs to get go down to. Americans need price cuts uh, more than anything. Uh, we need uh, reasonably priced new vehicles, and um, so ICE vehicles can't get there. They're too complicated and too expensive to build uh, uh, on on that on the the size vehicle that Americans would like. I mean, Americans don't like small vehicles. <laughs> we, we just don't like small vehicles. I mean, we've had them, and uh, I've worked in the car business for ten years, trying to sell vehicles. Uh, ran a big dealership, and and yeah. Small vehicles are very difficult to sell in the United States. People don't like them. And so it, it needs to be a large enough vehicle and priced in the $20,000, $25,000 range. And that will be a super hot seller if somebody can come up with that. Uh, that's really where the market is. And and the Chinese are heading that way. So BYD uh, could probably do that in the United States if it had access to the market. It's not looking at uh, building cars in Mexico and then importing them to the United States that way. And uh, Tesla is building a factory in Mexico to build its low-end vehicles there. So I, I think we were going, we're going to see uh, EVs in the nice EVs in the $25,000 range here in the next few years. What's happening in the new and used vehicle markets? Well, used car prices are dropping. They've dropped a whole bunch already. They're uh, they spiked by uh, <laughs> just a, a hilarious amount. I mean, it, it's just not even. I mean, you can't even take this seriously. Hardly, it spiked by like fifty five percent in a year and a half uh, during the pandemic, and and so now the the prices are coming down on that. They've already uh, given up maybe a third of the price spike, and um, that it's just. They have hit a ceiling, and the consumers are not willing to pay those prices anymore. They're now a little bit more critical, and um, sales volume have held up roughly as as dealers have cut prices, and auction prices have come down on the wholesale side also. So dealers have been sort of able to maintain the profit margins, which are very, still very rich. I mean, they they extraordinarily rich. So they they could they could thin them down without problem. And uh, but there's still enough demand for used vehicles to where dealers don't have to go f- uh, eat into the profit margins yet. New vehicles uh, sales are roughly flat, and um, uh, this uh, you know, recently they they've jumped a lot in 2023 from 2022. So we've seen the big jump. Um, prices are. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they're struggling, and uh, the new vehicles are uh, are harder to cut prices on, and uh, because you have the manufacturers and they have they they put incentives on them and they give rebates and so they're playing these kinds of games. And uh, Tesla has cut prices a bunch of times. Uh, Tesla doesn't put rebates on cars, so they, they just cut the, the sticker price. We've seen that in some other vehicles. So overall, the trend needs to be for price cuts on uh, new vehicles. We just haven't seen that yet. And used vehicles, we've seen it. New vehicles, we have not. We're waiting for it. Prices have, have calmed down. They're not, not rising anymore. They're sort of leveled off at this very high plateau. And uh, with sales still being up, but inventories... Inventories are building now, so eventually price cutting time will show up and, and uh, deals will have to be made because we, we transition from shortages to having an oversupply of vehicles, of ICE vehicles, and uh, it, it, uh, it, this will result in, in, in further uh, discounts and rebates and, and, and so forth. So um, I expect new vehicle prices to, uh, to hit lower, but but slowly and not like used vehicles. And I don't know how far used vehicle prices will drop. That, that's really is interesting to watch. Uh, they won't give up all of the pandemic spike, but, but my gut feeling is they may give up about half of that spike and, um, and then eventually stop dropping. Wolf, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Wolf Street? WolfStreet.com, it's all about business, finance, and money. Uh, 
It's free. There's no paywall. We have a lively comment section as well. So join us at wolfstreet.com. Wolf, what's the best way for people to follow you? Well, just come to wolfstreet.com. That's my platform, and uh, that's the best place. You see my comments. I reply to lots of comments. And if people want to contact me through the site, they can do that as well. Wolf, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He was speaking to us from San Francisco. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Mark Leibovit, and Wolf Richter. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or for our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from Tony Mitchell, the Director of Marketing for RecycleCo. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for RecycleCo. Tony, welcome back to Company Showcase. Hey, Jim. It's great to be back. It's been a while since we heard from you. How are things with the company? Yeah, it's uh, been a while, Jim. And as a fellow shareholder, uh, it's been excruciating to not be able to speak about our number of positive uh, things going on within the company. As we watched our share price and others in our sector, you know, hit hard during the recent downturn in commodity prices for uh, battery materials. What I can say um, with 100% certainty, nothing has changed with the company and the viability of our technology. Other than interest for our process continues to grow. And, um, you know, in fact, we've had major early testing partners who went through smaller scale testing of the materials with Recyclico come back highly motivated to do larger scale testing. After they've gone away, you know, did their due diligence and comparing our recycling processes to others. You know, I personally think this renewed interest is driven partly by the soft commodity prices affecting the battery recycling industry. While at the same time, you know, high interest rates aren't helping those competing recyclers who are caught up in advanced construction phase. This could effectively mean, you know, other competing processes are found to be lacking or just not as financially viable as our patented, highly efficient closed loop recycling process, which makes me think, you know, uh, these days, only their most financially prudent and truly efficient process will make it through this difficult time. So with that said, when you consider where we're currently trading and our market cap with approximately $17 million in the bank and no debt, well, Jim, these facts are, you know, paired with a, having a joint venture with a highly reputable partner in Taiwan positions us very well going forward from here. How are things progressing with the company's first joint venture in Taiwan? Things are going great on that, that front, Jim. Um, our leadership team is in regular calls with Zenith's team on the ground in Taiwan as we ensure our uh, commercial engineering drawings meet the specs of the space you know, we've been allocated over there. Essentially, we're following the plans we've laid out since we first announced our joint venture with Zenith back in June of last year. And we're currently aiming for commissioning our Taiwan plant during the last quarter of uh, next year, 2025. So beyond the current market conditions, things couldn't be better on the joint venture side of things. So I'm happy with that. I heard you recently had some big visitors to your demonstration plant. Yes, we did, Jim. And, um, you know, uh, there's a bit of a backstory. Back in November, I reached out again to uh, Sandy, uh, Sandy Monroe from Monroe Live, who's a big fan of our lean process, and uh, asked him if a fellow YouTuber named uh, Jason Fenske of Engineering Explained would be interested in checking us out. And, um, you know, for those uh, listeners who aren't familiar with Jason, his channel has uh, 3.7 million loyal subscribers and has built his following on asking the tough questions and making complex subjects easier for people to understand. So with, you know, all the myths and disinformation floating around our industry, I, I wanted to get these two highly respected guys in the same room with Norm Chow of Kometco, who's well-respected around the world in his own right. You know, many of the myths and hype around the uh, lithium-ion battery industry, um, the recycling industry, to rest. 
while answering questions on our unique battery recycling process. And the result is about 50 minutes of pure gold between these three awesome guys as they address a number of um, you know great questions posed by their numerous followers on Twitter. And uh, you know we'll add a link below to that candid, uh, unended discussion. And I say no punches were uh, were pulled. So if you want a complete, unvarnished take on where things stand with us and the battery industry as a whole, it's well worth your time. How's the search for your next CEO going? Well, Jim, our interim CEO, uh, Zarko Maselgia, uh, just had his last day. And we wish him well in his future endeavors after seven years of working with the company, primarily a CTO, but in the last year and a half as interim CEO. You know, making the transition from CTO to interim CEO after a long-term CEO, Larry Ray, passed in September of 2022, would be challenging for anyone. As you know, Larry, uh, as you know, Jim, you, you, you knew Larry. <laughs> he <laughs> left very big boots. He left very big boots to fill after being CEO for over 35 years. But the team will be always thankful to Zarco for stepping in and doing his best. That said, at this pivotal stage of the company's transition from proving our technology works as efficiently as described in multiple test partner scenarios, to taking the next steps and ultimately becoming the global standard in lithium-ion battery recycling, uh, stage two lithium-ion battery recycling, we require you know a CEO with deep, deep C-suite experience who can negotiate with major players at the very tip top of this massive industry uh, while leading our team and achieving our long-term goals. And from what I understand from the leadership team, we are actively seeking candidates um, from the battery materials and technology space who can take us to the next level. And I'm hopeful that we'll find the right fit soon. So while I can't say anything more at the moment, I ask our many long-term loyal supporters locally and around the globe for their continued patience as we navigate through these short-term challenges towards the bright future we're all focused on achieving. Tony, for people new to the company, where are you traded and how can they get more information? No problem, Jim. We're, uh, we're traded on the TSX Venture under the ticker symbol AMY, on the OTCQB under the ticker symbol AMYZF, and on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol ID4. And you can get more information on our website at Recyclico.com. Tony, thank you so much for the update. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for Recyclico. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on February 29th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. 